Craig's third lecture. Okay, welcome back. Um, I realize that I've sort of introduced a, a lot of notation to you. I, I hope that we've motivated this well enough along the way that uh, it, the notation isn't overwhelming. It's just, you know, in a lot of mathematics, once you uh, have a really clear idea of something, you realize that when you write it down, <laughs> uh, it ends up looking more complicated than it really is. But I, I wanted to review sort of the basics of, uh, of what we've been doing recently. The, the idea, of course, you know, I, I reminded you of a few of the examples we've been talking about. I, I guess it wouldn't hurt to, to mention some of the simpler ones that we started with. I forget exactly which order I had this first two in, but one of them is just the half of the real line. Another is the entire real line, and then I had another space um, where I took the real line and I just added a half line to it, uh, the, the positive half of the, the y-axis, if you will. And it didn't take us very long to distinguish, for example, uh, some of these spaces from one another by a very vague notion of uh, how many ends the space has. You, you just, uh, what you do is you um, you take compact sets and you look at their complement. Those, those complements are called neighborhoods of infinity, and you just count up how many components are, of those neighborhoods are unbounded. So in this case, you put a compact. No, no matter how big of compact set, you have the one unbounded component sitting out there. So this is one ended. Similarly, we, this is two ended, three ended. And then all three of those spaces over there have infinitely many ends, and so um, at that stage we really couldn't say much about how to distinguish one of those from another. So our goal was to put a little more structure on the ends of the space. Uh, first of all, that, that initial definition didn't really even say what we mean by an end. We defined what it meant for a space to have one end, two ends, or three ends, without ever saying what an end is. Um, to start distinguishing the others, we wanted to be a little more precise. So um, what we did was this. We said, OK, first of all, um, let's write our space x as a countable union of larger and larger compact sets. Okay? Because we put some requirements on our space, that's always possible. Uh, remember, x is not any old space. We're requiring that it be. Uh, uh, a, a metric space that's locally compact, uh, locally path connected, path connected, has a countable basis. So, um, so we can always do this for the spaces we're interested in. And for most spaces that are respectable geometric topologists would be interested in, you can do this. Um, the neighborhoods of infinity are the complements of those compact sets. So the neighborhoods of infinity, as i gets bigger, get smaller and smaller. And since the compact sets fill up the entire space, uh, the intersection of the neighborhoods of infinity is empty. Uh, and now what we do is for each of these neighborhoods of infinity, we look at the number of, or we look at the collection of components. Um, the niceness properties of our space are going to ensure that each of these neighborhoods only has finitely many unbounded components. Okay. And uh, let's see. In fact, we, we saw an example based on a good question I got that said that you can't easily come up with examples where a neighborhood of infinity will have infinitely many unbounded components, but not if you put in these extra conditions about local path connectedness and local compactness. Okay. And now we make a mathematical definition of what an end of your space is. An end is going to be a sequence of these components with the property that the... Uh, the second term in your sequence is contained in the first term, the third term is contained in the second term, and so on. So each of these sequences defines an end. And if you apply it to a, a space like this one, uh, you sort of see that if you take bigger and bigger compact sets and you choose a component that's contained in a component of the previous neighborhood, it sort of forces you out in a specific direction along the tree. And so it, it really does sort of grab a hold of this notion of what, what a specific end of that space is. Okay. 
Now, if you just stop right here, we can already distinguish this space from the two above it, because this space, it turns out, has un. That would be a nice project if, if this stuff interests you. That would be a nice project to think about. But I, I'll just warn you that uh, uh, this takes some significant effort. Uh, but it's quite interesting. Um, Hausdorff is actually kind of fun and, and not entirely trivial. Um, so let's talk about it for a second, and then I'll say why, why, why do I really care about Hausdorff here? Well, uh, case one You take a pair of points, right? You want to find disjoint neighborhoods. Well, if both of those points were in X, X was already Hausdorff, and all of those old open sets are still here. So we can check that one off. Case two would be where X is an element of X. And the other point, now just to stick with my notational convention, epsilon. Uh, is an element of the ends of X. And again, I, I will apologize for re not writing down as much as I would normally do in a, in a lecture, but let's... I like this picture the best because it's the most interesting. Um, what if your point uh, X is... right here. And epsilon is one of the ends. How do I find disjoint open sets? Well, the picture almost proves it, right? Choose your compact set so big that it contains x in the interior, and then all of the complementary components are, are disjoint from that interior, and so the neighborhood you define for those guys um, We'll miss, the, we'll miss the interior of that compact set which contains X. So you've got an open subset of the original space containing X, in particular the interior of your compact set, and then um, whatever neighborhood of, of the uh, complementary components that corresponds to your end, that, that is going to be <coughs> from, uh, from that. So. So choose CI so big that X is an element of the interior of CI. And then interior of CI intersected with any of the uh, n, i, uh, j with a hat on it is, uh, is disjoint. So that intersection is empty. And your epsilon, your n to epsilon, where is it, right here, is in one of those. So this is for all, for all j. Well, let me not say too much more than that. Okay, and let's see, I kind of want to leave those there. Case three is where you've got two points that are in the boundary. So we have delta and epsilon are both in the set of ends of x. Well, what does that mean? That means that epsilon is equal to one of these sequences, n1, j1, n2, j2, n3, j3, and so on. And delta, same deal, 
it's one of the sequence chosen from the same collection. So it's N1, K1, N1, K2, sorry, N2, K2, N3, K3. But of course, we're proving Hausdorff, so these are not the same. So eventually, you're going to get to a point. These may agree in the first slot, agree in the second slot. But as soon as they disagree, then put a hat on each of those guys, and you've got a disjoint pair of neighborhoods, one, one for epsilon and one for delta. So um, as soon as as n. Uh, let's see, K, J, I, I've used K already, N sub I, J, I is not equal to N sub I, K, I. Uh, I need a little more space. As soon as that happens, then uh, putting hats on each of those guys, gives us our disjoint neighborhoods. So, So a corollary of what we've just done now is that uh, you know we, we have created this big space x hat that contains x and it contains the ends. So the ends are a subspace, and so we can think of the ends of x. as a topological space itself, ends of x is uh, compact and house door. Okay. And now this isn't exactly a direct corollary of the proposition, but it is really a corollary of the proof. And that is that uh, Moreover, the space of ends is what we call totally disconnected. Can you come across that term when you're what, what that means is the components of this space are they only contain a point. There are no connected subsets of the ends uh, except for one point sets. And you can kind of see why if you think about the proof here. These, uh, these neighborhoods of the ends that I've been describing are actually both open and closed sets in the subspace topology. And so you can, you know, you can shatter that boundary into these um, into disjoint open sets and separate any one point from any other. All right, so that, that last part is an exercise. Okay, and, and then the, the nice thing about uh, having an actual topology is we can come back to this space and we can convince ourselves now that uh, these two spaces are different also because they both had countably many ends, but if you think carefully about the topology on this one, you realize that the, uh, you know, we're putting a point at infinity, essentially, when we compactify. But that sequence of points is going to converge to the end we have here. If you take any one of those neighborhoods that contains this point, it's going to contain infinitely many of those other ones. Whereas these points are isolated, because if I choose a compact set that looks like this, then you're only going to have a single component of a complement of any other compact set. So that point is sitting out there by itself, as are all these others. We have a single limit point. Here we have a compact Hausdorff space 
where all of the points are isolated except for two, and you know that's a topological invariant, the number of, of non-isolated points. So we get this space. And down here, there are no isolated points, because no matter which end you go out on, every neighborhood uh, has lots of these, uh, these rays going out in, in similar directions. And so the boundary of this is a compact Hausdorff totally disconnected space. And there's a famous topology theorem that says those are all Cantor sets. And when I say, as a, math, as a topologist, when I say Cantor set, I just mean it's homeomorphic to whatever your preferred Cantor set is. Can I ask a question? Yes. So it's not like a Cantor set taken from the line and like draped in a circle or anything like that. It's actually a Cantor set that you could embed in the line. You, you could embed it in the line. Okay. Right, right. The thing is, if you wrap it around a circle, there are so many gaps in there that you could just use one of those gaps to, <laughs> to open it up and put it on the line anyway. And, you know, Cantor sets appear just in an amazing array of places in topology. There, you know, I can leave it to Professor Calcutt to show you some really exotic Cantor sets in three-dimensional space that uh, have properties you just would not <laughs> think a Cantor set ought to have. Um, so yeah, I, my, my advisor once said, anybody who really understands the Cantor set knows a lot of mathematics. There's, there's just a, a, a lot happening there. But for us, you know, the, the fact that every single point is an accumulation point there, that, that tells us that it's different than these others. OK, so there are two other things I would ask a question? Yeah, go ahead. Did you say that x hat was a metric space? With, with some work, you, you can prove that, yes. So is there like a, dis there's a distance between one of the end points and like some other point? On well, I, 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 I won't claim that there is an, an easy metric to, <laughs> okay. to understand, but if, 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 you, if you look in your, your uh, I think you have Munkers as your text, yeah. there's something called the uh, Yurson metrization theorem. It's actually my favorite theorem in that whole book, but you really need to do a lot of uh, general topology to get to that thing. And that, that theorem will come in and say there does exist a metric that gives you the, the right topology on that. But it takes some work. In these concrete cases, you could probably come up with a, a metric by some sort of hands-on. In particular, I've been focusing on, uh, on the end space of trees. And uh, you, you could probably come up with a strategy for, for putting a metric on it. But yeah, the general result takes, uh, takes a little bit of uh, general topology. The thing I like about the Urson metrization theorem so much is you use infinite dimensional topology to, to do it. <laughs> You embed your space in this infinite dimensional metric space and then say, well, it's a subspace of a metric space, so it has a metric. But, but the embedding you use is very clever, and uh, the infinite dimensional space you use is not really so hard to understand. It's, it's just an infinite product of copies of the line or the interval. It impresses people to say you're doing infinite dimensional topology. <laughs> got to do some picking and choosing here. One of the things that excites me in mathematics is when you can uh, find one area of mathematics and, and make a connection with another. You've been doing that in this class already in that you have been uh, using algebra in the, ser in the service of topology. You know, you've defined the fundamental group and what that often does for you is it allows you to use your knowledge of abstract algebra to prove theorems in topology. You you can prove that uh, you know a couple of uh, of surfaces are not homeomorphic, not by any topological properties essentially, but by turning it into an algebra problem where you associate a group to each of those spaces, and then you simply observe that those groups are not isomorphic. Uh, this is a two-way street. There's an area of mathematics called geometric group theory, 
which is essentially to use topology to help you understand certain groups. And so I think since I've just got a limited amount of time left, I think what I would like to end things up with is giving you a, a brief introduction to, to how that's done. This, this might go a little bit fast, but uh, again, you'll have, some, you'll have an expert around to ask questions of if, if this intrigues you. And I, I think some of the topics that, that I may be breezing over are ones you're going to be covering in this class. Anyway, they involve things like covering spaces and fundamental groups. And so it's kind of a nice topic to bring in. So this is an application of uh, ends to group theory. Okay, so here's the general strategy one uses. Okay, so first of all, um, I, I, I don't want to be too general here. I want our group G to be a finitely presented group, or finitely presentable at least. So let G be a finitely, and I'm going to say presented, but again, uh, it shouldn't really matter what the presentation is. Now, just in case this doesn't match the terminology you're using, what that means is there's a group presentation with finitely many generators and finitely many relators. So let me just list these A1 through uh, AN, and then I have some relators R1 through, uh, let's say, RK. Number of generators and relators, of course, don't have to have anything to do with each other. Now, we want to use topology to study the group. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to build a space which has exactly that group as its fundamental group. And this is always possible. And uh, you've perhaps seen some of the ingredients that go into this. But let me just describe it. So the first thing is we need n generators for the group. So um, well, let, 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 let me write the words down here. So build. a space, I'm going to call it K sub G, G for the group, um, with pi 1 of KG isomorphic to that group G. And let me say a little bit about how that's done. You want to make sure your group has n generators, so it's all I'm going to do to start out. I'm going to have a vertex, and I'm going to put n loops on there. So a1, a2, a3, and then however many, I won't try drawing a general picture, however many generators you have, that's how many loops you have here. Okay, so if I stopped right here, I would have a space whose fundamental group uh, is generated by these three loops. Uh, it's a free group on three generators. Is that something that makes sense to everybody? OK. Now, in order to introduce the relators, these are sort of extra rules that this group has to follow. And so, for example, you might have a relator. Suppose R1 is, is the, uh, the word that A1 squared A2. Now, really, when I say it's a relator, what I'm really saying is that A1 squared A2 is equal to the identity element. Okay. So, again, I'm not quite sure all the notation you've been using. But if I want to introduce that relator, what I do is I just take a disk and I sew it onto this space so that what I would do is I would divide up the boundary into three pieces. And I would label the first piece A1, 
and I would label the second piece A1, and then I would label the third piece A2. And now I would take this disk and I would sew it to this bouquet of circles by taking the first arc and running all the way around A1. And then I reach this and I say, okay, I've got to go around A1 a second time. And then A2, I would go around it and I would stop there. And if I stopped right there, I would have a space whose fundamental group has exactly the same generators and it has that one relator. And now if I just go through here and for each relator I sew in a disk to force that relationship to happen. Um, I mean, the point is when I sew this disk in, that loop it now contracts, right? You, can <laughs> you could use the disk to contract the loop A1 squared A2. Yes? Is the disk built in? Yes, yeah, yeah, this is, a, this is meant to be a two-dimensional disk, okay. and so, right, the, yeah, the reason I shaded it is so that you, right, I'm sewing a two-dimensional object. The point is that that loop can be contracted to the center point of this disk now, and so the element A1 squared A2, which used to be very non-trivial, is now trivial, and that's what relators are all about, right, is you, you choose some elements and say, I want, I want these guys to become trivial. And so by, by doing this, uh, in this case, k times, at the end, I will have a space which is made up of one vertex, k loops, and then, now these disks, they're no longer disks, right? They get kind of crumpled when you sew them in there. But it's actually a pretty nice space. Uh, if you want to put a topology on it, you just use, a, use the quotient topology that says how this, these things are glued. Why can't you then contract A1 to the identity is, like, why can't you contract more than you want to when you do that? Oh, well, you know, uh, ha have you looked at the cipher van campen theorem? Not, not in this class. So, so, so there is a theorem, which I'm, I'm guessing you'll see probably by the end of the semester, which actually will tell you exactly what's happening here. Yeah, but, but yeah, that does, that does seem concerning because you, you've gone around here, but, um, you know, it's not like this whole arc has gotten identified to the point. So you, you really don't have, um, you don't really have a way of, you, you could take the A1 loop and you could push it over to here, but that's not quite a contraction there. So I, I won't pretend that I'm giving you a rigorous uh, answer to your question, but you, you will see why. why attaching this disk does exactly what I say. And I, I, that's one of the first things you'll probably want to think about when you see the cipher thing happen theorem. That theorem is all about if I have two spaces and I know the fundamental group of each, what happens when I glue them together? So let's take the fundamental group of one, take the fundamental group of the other, and glue those groups together in a certain way. It's a great theorem. You'll, you will enjoy seeing it. Okay, but, but the, the big picture here, again, I'm going to I'm going to cheat here and I'm just going to say etc. because I'm not going to try to write down all the words it would take to describe how you get space KG. Um, now you can use covering space theory. Okay, so, so step one was to get a presentation for your group. Step two is to actually realize that group topologically. By the way, we call KG, the presentation two complex. And really, I shouldn't say the presentation two complex, because as you might know, a given group could have many different presentations. This is just one of them. So. There's some issues that are probably clicking through your mind already about what, what I'm doing is going to yield the same answer depending on how I, which presentation I start. Okay, step three. Now notice this space is compact. So, it's, you know, what does the theory of ends have to do with it? It's compact because it's just made up of finitely many pieces, all of which are compact. Um, now I want to take a covering space of this. Okay, so there is a theorem 
that says that every nice topological space has a covering space that's simply connected. So um, that's called the universal cover of the space. Okay, so uh, let K G tilde be the universal cover. Of AG. Okay. And it's all that really means is it turns out that that every nice topological space, that there is an extra condition that I'm burying right now that you have to toss in there, but uh, the spaces we create here do satisfy that property. So Whatever that property is, that comes under the heading of nice right now. Every nice space has a simply connected covering space. And in fact, there is only one simply connected covering space. That's sort of why this guy gets to be universal. It is the cover that covers all covers. <laughs> that, that's the... So if you take any other covering space of KG, then this universal guy will be a cover of that thing also. And, and it, that makes it a unique object here. So, um, So it's the unique, simply connected covering space. Or KG. Uh, yeah. Okay. And now there's something which uh, I refer to this as a meta theorem. I'm not going to try stating it precisely, but there is a theorem that says that uh, how do I want to say it? I want to say that no matter which choices you make to get to this stage. The universal cover, if, if, the, if you chose different presentations, if everybody in this room chose a different presentation for the group, then all of your spaces would look different, and all of your universal covers would be, look different. But from a distance, those covers will look the same. And in particular, they will have the same number of ends. Okay? So we can actually define the number of ends of a group. Okay. The number of ends of a group is, well, do this, go to the universal cover, and then apply the theory that we've just been doing. Okay, so, um, so this, again, I'm gonna, this is a, a vague statement. If uh, G is isomorphic to G prime, in particular, if, if you have two different presentations for G, which give you the same group, then K G tilde and K G prime tilde look the same when viewed at a distance. Not, not a very mathematical statement here. Okay, so in particular, at a distance you're not going to see all the little quirky local properties of the space, but you hopefully can see how many ends they have. In particular, uh, they have the same, and not just the same number of ends, but they have the same uh, end structure. So if for, if, for example, you wanted to put a topology on those ends, then uh, you, you could use all that extra information as well. So I, I feel like now it's time to do some examples. Oh, OK. Well, so let's, let, let's make the definition, though. So um, definition, the number of ends.
of a finitely presented group is the number of n's of one of these kg tilde spaces. And again, the, the nice thing is you can pick whichever presentation in whichever space you, you want, really. So, examples. Let's just let G be the integers. You might as well choose your favorite space whose fundamental group is the integers, and I assume that's the circle. And you may never have spoken in this language, but you know that there's a covering space of that circle, which is just the line. And clearly the line is simply connected. So this is the universal covering space for the circle. There are other covering spaces in particular the circle onto itself, <laughs> wrapping around many times. But this is the, this is the universal covering space. And we, we've already been looking at the line, right? So we know the line has two ends. And so in this terminology, we can say that, uh, that Z is a two-ended group. Another example. Um, let's do z plus z. You know a space whose fundamental group is z plus z? Torus. torus, yeah, exactly. The torus is S1 cross S1, so there is a, a theorem about products. So I guess I, I could have also said z cross z, of course, same, same thing. Um, but yeah, the torus. Any idea what the universal cover of the torus would be? The plane. Yeah, the plane. So remember, the torus is just S1 cross S1, and actually there's a product theorem for universal covers. Each of those circles is covered by the line, and so the product of circles is covered by the product of those lines. And this is a very nice uh, covering space to look at anyway. I kind of like to tessellate it because each of those squares can be sort of wrapped around and pushed down onto the torus. But, but really, that's, that's more than we need to know here. Clearly, the plane is simply connected, and it has one end, right? So we've gone to a more complicated group in some sense, but we've gone from a two-ended group to a one-ended group. So z plus z is one-ended. So if you're taking an abstract algebra class and they ask you to prove that these are not isomorphic, you could say, well, that one is two-ended, and this one is one-ended, and so by topology, uh, we know they're not isomorphic one. <laughs> Maybe not the most efficient proof of that theorem, but uh, this is a theorem that has some, some pretty useful consequences. Let me mention another example. Well, let, let's go with Z2. In other words, the finite group with just two elements. Uh, do you know a space which has that as its, uh, as its fundamental group? You told we I didn't know a presentation of that. You told us how to get a space out of a presentation. R okay. So. And then, have you ever heard of a projective plane? Perhaps not. Yeah, but but you're exactly right. There, there, the, the way to construct it is start with a circle and then take a disk that is sort around twice. And it turns out that that's a famous object in mathematics, uh, which is called uh, real projective space. It comes up in geometry. 
Um, but the interesting thing about it is its universal cover is just the two sphere. Okay. Two sphere is simply connected. How many ends does two sphere have? <laughs> it's, it's compact. So th this group is going to be zero ended. Okay, so Z2 is zero. In fact, there's a theorem there. Any finite group is going to have the, the universal cover is going to be a finite to one cover. So it's not too hard to prove that the universal cover is always going to be compact in those cases. So all finite groups are zero-ended. When topologists study group theory, we're not very good at finite groups. We, we think of them as all being the same. <laughs> They're all trivial to us. We, we're really interested in studying infinite groups when we do geometric group theory. We leave, we leave the finite group theory for the, for the experts in that area. We just don't have that much to offer. But well, let me uh, toss one more example in, and then I have an interesting fact to close with. I want to take the free group on two generators. Okay, and we've kind of met that recently, right? If you want to create a space which that with that as its fundamental group, you take your bouquet of two circles. And you don't have to sew any disks on because there are no relators here. Have you ever seen the universal cover or a covering space of this, which seems like it might be the universal cover? Each of these circles gets unwrapped into lines, but it happens a lot of times. And in fact, what the space ends up looking like in order to fit this picture in, I'm making these lines look shorter and shorter, but they all are really infinitely long lines. And it turns out, remember I, the, the graph I was drawing earlier, I always called it T3. It was the, the one graph which has the prop, infinite graph where every vertex is index 3. Well, this one is the same deal except it's index 4. So we can call this guy using that same notation, T4. <laughs> I prefer the other one because you don't have to squeeze so hard to draw the picture. But if you understand the other one, you understand this one just as well also, right? So we can now say that the group F2 is an infinite ended group. We can even say more. We could say it has um, uncountably many ends. We could say even more, if you'd like. We could say that this group has a boundary, and that boundary is a Cantor set. And with a little more time with you, we, we could go into that direction and talk about boundaries of groups. Uh, we won't be able to do that. But uh, um, So anyway, the point is F2 is infinite. There's a famous theorem that says that every group is either zero-ended, one-ended, two-ended, or infinite. -ended. You never get a three-ended or a four-ended group. And that's not a very hard theorem to prove. It's just something I don't have time for. Uh, not only that, but if you know how many ends you have, that actually tells you some information about the group itself. Uh, every zero-ended group is finite. That's, you can probably write down a proof for that as you, or think through a proof as you walk to your next class. Every two-ended group, well, it doesn't have to be the integers but it has to have a finite index subgroup that is the integers, which means it's almost the integers. Um, and then there, there are famous theorems about infinite ended groups which say, whenever this is the case, it really is like you have two simpler groups glued together, kind of like this, and then you can break it down from there. So this is sort of what I view as sort of the step one in the, the subject of geometric group theory. Not using group theory to help you with topology, but now using topology to help you with group theory. So, thank you. I'm happy to answer questions if you have a little time.
Thank you.